So yeah, we've got Danny Noonan with us this evening from the Boone and Crockett Club. And he's gonna be talking with us this evening about uh, wildlife conservation and fair chase ethics. Uh, we don't have a bunch of slides this evening, so that's pretty easy. Uh, this will be more of a, a conversation type event this evening. And uh, you know, so I encourage everybody to uh, join in and engage with the conversation. Uh, so uh, I guess with that, I, I'll let you kind of fill everybody in on your background and, and whatnot, Danny. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, yeah, I, we figured we'd leave it a little more conversational. Just ethics can be cut and dry, and sometimes it can be, you know, up to each individual person. So that's why it was a little less important to, to have a slide to tell you what is ethical, what isn't ethical, because sometimes it comes down to your situation. Um, uh, with that also, I think that Sam may jump in eventually, but if he doesn't get a chance, um, he wanted to mention something about the, the Facebook page to go on and check that out. And then also um, um, he wanted to recognize a few folks, so he'll, he'll get back on here soon. Um, so I'm Danny Noonan. I'm working for the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, we're North America's oldest wildlife conservation organization. We were founded in 1887 by Theodore Roosevelt with several other uh, prominent conservation and outdoor outdoorsmen. Um, you know, at the time that the Boone and Crockett Club was started, there was actually a, a need for um, a little more restraint and, and commitment to, to preserving these animals. Um, so Boone and Crockett Club was started because back in the late 1800s, there were no modern game laws. There were no uh, they were just establishing National Park Services, uh, Bureau of Land Management, things like that. And they, uh, at the time, there were, uh, you know, the media was really just a couple of magazines around the country. And a gentleman named Ger George Bird Grinnell um, was in charge of what was called Forest and Stream. Now it's Field and Stream. Um, he actually, he was writing conservation messages quite a bit. Um, because at the time, people were going out west, and they were they were populating new cities. They were um, developing crops and land to to harvest crops and and um, and livestock. Um, so, and there were no rules. You know, you could go out there and you could shoot bison from the train. Um, so, you know, the animals there were no there was no limit bag limits at all. Um, so eventually, things were starting to run its course, and and there was a problem. Um, species were starting to, to go extinct. And so in 1887, um, or maybe shortly before that, he approached George Bird Grinnell. Um, and he actually, he showed up and, and, and you know, knocked on his door and he was upset. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was upset about some things that he saw in, in that publication. Shortly after though, because they, they they were leaders in what they did. Um, they realized that there was a there was a platform for Theodore Roosevelt to to carry some messages. Um, George Bird Grinnell was really a brain, and and Theodore Roosevelt was a voice. And so, in, later on, they established the Boone and Crockett Club in a in a December day in New York City, of all places, um, not out west and not not in Wyoming, Montana, but in New York City, um, the Boone and Crockett Club was founded. Um, you know, going back to, to the lack of modern game laws, um, you know, so these animals were going extinct. They, they were, um, and, and bear with me too. I'm not much of a public speaker. So as I muddle through, through things, I appreciate your guys' time. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so Boone and Crockett as, as it goes back to 1887, because there was a need to start protecting these, these animals and wildlife, they actually, um, they, they thought that these animals were gonna go extinct. Um, so they approached the Bronx Zoo eventually, and uh, they dedicated um, an area. And I've got Jack Renault in here. And, and was it the National Collection of Heads and Horns back then, Jack? Do you yeah. remember? It was the National Collection of Heads and Horns. Um, <laughs> at the Bronx Zoo and it was dedicated to the to the vanishing um, big game of North America as they felt that there were not going to be deer and elk for you and I to hunt and, and see today. Um, they really were going extinct. So in order for them to um, make it so these animals weren't going extinct they had to they had to come up with a plan um, because prior to all this in Europe hunting was a, a king's sport uh, a rich man's sport 
And now suddenly you're in the United States and it was free. Um, it was free reign to go kill as much animals as you possibly could, wanted. Um, it was money and, and it, was, it was game for the taking. Well, as those populations depleted, they decided, you know, they, there needs to be a system for it and, and we need to figure out what that is. And that's where you enter in the, the modern game laws and the ethics to be a real sportsman. Um, so, uh, and why ethics? Why is ethics important um, in, in the world of hunting? Well, today you're defending the notion of hunting continuously. You know, people are saying, attacking hunting that um, you're killing game and, and it's not right. And there's a lot of notions where it's considered unsportsmanlike. Um, most sportsmen know that they're doing everything they can. You know, poachers are not hunters, and um, yet we do get attacked quite a bit. So not only, one, do you want to be ethical for the, the simple fact to keep this tradition alive, you also, yeah, you also want to, to, to be ethical because nobody wants to wound an animal and, and see it suffer. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that, that hunting ethically is important. Um, a big part of ethical hunting is the modern laws that each state implies um, because it's, it's backed by a scientific wildlife management as to how much, how much game is actually in the field for you to go out and hunt, right? That's how many tags there are. Um, that's how they determine it. But, but they, they really needed to institute the notion of fair chase into that. You know, why are there these laws more than just science, because back in the late 1800s, they didn't, they didn't calculate all of that. They, they, they established fair chase to give the game a sporting advantage so that that game has a, a, a fair chance to escape. Because if, if you're hunting at night with a spotlight, there is no, there is no fair chase. If, you're, if you can shoot you know, two miles away, um, you know, we don't tell you how, how far is too far, but if you're, if you're not proficient at two, two miles or a mile you know i'm not proficient at 400 yards for that matter um but if you're not proficient at 200 yards that's an unethical shot for you to be taking yeah that's there's no reason to to take a shot that's outside of your your limits um so um more about the boone and crockett club uh trying to intertwine that with with where we get to ethics so um uh, eventually, after all of these these laws were established, because the Boone and Crockett Club members later on went on to to form the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, um, the Forest Service, um, uh, you know, most of those agencies, and, uh, and and it was the members that championed that. They also championed the the Pittman Robertson Act. So anytime anybody buys a a, a gun or ammunition, those the taxes, the eleven percent, goes back to state and federal agencies to spend on wildlife management and habitat. Um, so it's actually sportsmen that are paying the way. You know, some people may say tags. It's not, it's not the hikers that are buying hiking gear, backpacking gear. Um, it's, it's hunters and, and anglers later on that, that um, was another law that, that was established, um, the Dingle we, Johnson Act. Could we pause there? Yes, sir. Because I pause. think what we're trying to do tonight is have it as interactive as possible. Yep. Uh, I didn't know if he was prepped on that. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Interactive. So as possible. let's talk about um, how many of you on the Zoom are familiar with uh, uh, Pittman and uh, um, Robertson, Pittman Robertson, 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 Robertson and yeah, uh, and, and the Dingle Johnson is Dingle Johnson, fishing. Right. Yep, yep. So one is fishing. Does everyone know which one was the fishing one? Anybody? The second one, Sam. You, right. could have, you already said it. <laughs> right. Pittman, I think, is the uh, hunting. Is that correct? <laughs> So yeah. is he, I'm just rep repeating back. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. Good repetition. Yes. <laughs> PR, Pittman Robertson is, is the hunting one. So oh, good. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I always remembered it. So uh, you will po probably see this on the little quiz we do. Those are considered the two biggies because they fund almost all our conservation efforts. A tremendous really, amount. The no, really, that, a lot yeah. of people don't know about that. From yeah. your, your tags, they they – that's a good chunk of it. Um, the federal duck stamp is fantastic for, for a lot of conservation work. Um, but the Pittman Robertson is the biggest. Um, and, so, and so what you're saying is it's not the general fund taxes that support conservation efforts. It's the sportsmen through their purchase. 
Yes. That support conservation. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that it's yeah. the sportsmen, the hunters that are buying guns and ammo. And I say sportsmen, you know, not every, every gun enthusiast is a hunter. Um, but it is them that pay the way it's, it's an excise tax. Um, you, you pay for it and, and everybody benefits. Um, Which is why you, you kind of see the connection between our second amendment tradition and our hunting tradition and how that financially ties together to conserve wildlife and land. Yes, absolutely. It, it all ties together. A lot of people hey, know, Steve. Yeah. yeah. This is Garrett. Sam's been waiting for the host to allow him into the meeting, so. You might have quite a few there. Okay, yeah. I see a couple more. Yeah. Thank you, we'll Garrett. A little bit more. Oh, admit you're welcome. Welcome, then. Everybody, let's take a quick pause. Uh, Sam, are you on? Sam? And uh, okay. Tim Johnson, are you on? Tim Johnson? Yeah. Oh, connecting still, connecting. still connecting. Yeah, you'll have to watch that as we go along. Yeah. I have a question while we're waiting for them to come on. Uh, what was the other one? It was Pittman Roberts Act, and what was the other one? The Dingle Johnson Act, which is more fishing related, and I don't know the specific products in that category that get get uh, taxed. Um, but it is one of the primary ones for fishing. We're I'm our club, the Boone and Crockett Club, is a little more hunting, so. I'm not entirely aware of the specifics on Dingle Johnson. So I, I'd like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. So is it, so people who are mountain biking, I, and I'm just going to use the Bitterroot, for example, because it's where I go, but there's not much mountain biking up like Bass Creek or anything like that, but all these conservation places, that's, that's all originally funded by um, these, by fishermen and hunters? Possibly. Um, so a lot of organizations and agencies do other projects, funding projects and things like that. But what I can be, be very confident in saying is that 11% of all guns and ammo um, that get taxed go to conservation efforts. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's specifically down the bid route, whether it's paying for all of what's happening there or in other areas, you know, I, I don't know where it always goes. Um, a great chunk of it, uh, you know, sportsmen were really rewarded this year. They, they fought tooth and nail and very hard to get the Great American Outdoors Act passed this year, the mm -hmm. Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the money from the Pittman Robertson goes into those buckets, which, you know, it trickles down everywhere. Um, now, about the mountain bikers, unless they're paying some sort of fee, um, a mountain bike will not get ta isn't taxed. They're they're utilizing the the public land um, uh, that sportsmen essentially are paying for. And uh, me as a sportsman, I'm happy to do that um, very much. So I think that public land is public. Everybody owns yeah. it. Sure. Um, animals are a public trust. There's actually a thing called the public trust doctrine that was established to say that all animals in the United States, um, all, all wild animals are owned by everybody. There may be laws and regulations around them, but they are essentially yours, mine, um, Steve, Sam's, um, you know. And, and, and really, Danny, the idea is very Ameri American, American-centric um, in that, you know, the Europeans had this model of kings owned the Kings own the deer, yes. Kings own the elk, right? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we really have this, What's that? you know, and, and you could oh. be, uh, in, in certain areas, you could be prosecuted or executed for taking the king. Yes, yeah. Did every so talking about the democratization of sporting, really, right? We're, we're the envy of the world, for that matter, because we have an entire succinct model that that you know nobody else can really emulate as well as what we we've done because we we started out right in a right time um we got the right backing you know that's why george bird grinnell and, and theodore roosevelt worked so well together to get people on board you know roosevelt wasn't president until i think 1909 he started the club in 1887. Right. Um, he actually, he, well, he fell in love with the West because I think his mother and daughter died on the same day 
unfortunately. And he, he headed out West, got a ranch and, and now he's, you know, not now, but, um, he felt the need to, to do that. Um, <coughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> you got me a little sidetracked, Sam. Sorry. No, I don't mean to. I no, just, you're good. Uh, I want to make it flow. I'll, I'll side, I'll sidetrack too. If you're ever in New York, Visit Teddy Roosevelt's house. On Sagamore Hill, right? Um, where is I don't know. But I've been to Harry Truman's in St. Louis or Kansas City, Mo. And very modest, like any middle class home of the day. And Teddy Roosevelt came from the upper crust. And it's such a difference. But they're both magnificent tours. Oh. <laughs> and I suggest that strongly because... Um, you'd be impressed. <laughs> like if you're ever that way, go out of your way an hour if you have to, if you're ever in New York. Let me do a quick check. Tim Johnson, can you hear us? We got Tim Johnson on. Might be on mute. I want to make sure. You... Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you. Sam Rosling, you're on? Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Heather Allen joining in. Yep, I'm here. Okay, so let's flesh out this idea of sportsmen and hunters funding our lands. Welcome, Colonel, and our 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 game. What um, what do you anybody on Zoom want to add on to that? How important that is, and some thoughts there, Derek, Tyler. You have any thoughts? What was the question again? We're talking about the uh, uh, American idea going back to Teddy Roosevelt and Grinnell and many others of, of democratization of hunting. In other words, you and I, the common man, have access to the land, have access to the hunt. You know, in Europe, in, in certain areas, you, you had to get permission from the king before you could hunt. So, and then second point that Danny's making that we should discuss is we're funding through our second amendment, really, used to be our second amendment, and our, our hunting, we are funding massive conservation in this country of animals and land. Yeah. And uh, what can we do to, to get that message out better, I guess? Right. And, and that's the, the tricky question. The, the real question that I'd love to ask you guys on, on the Zoom call is, being that you and sportsmen fund those, those endeavors, what does it mean to, to incorporate ethics and be an ethical hunter. Um, how do you feel the two combine? Uh, what would it mean if hunters suddenly were displaying unethical tendencies, despite the fact that they're paying for, for all of these things to happen? Um, what do you think about that? I'll, I'll tell you what I think about it. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you what I think a lot. Um, you're, so you're asking when, when there's unethical practices, what does that do? To our what does it do to yeah. to the the um, perception of hunting when there's unethical practices? Um, despite having said, you know, you're, we're we have a say. We Let's have a skin in the game. First, <laughs> Let's hear what we. I have to say. Um, I think that it's about everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I try not to play with the stats too much, but I think that it's, it's almost everything. Um, you know, if you're not incorporating fair chase into the abilities to hunt, you're not giving the game a sporting advantage and, and you're just out there killing, right? You're just out there killing wantonly. Um, is there bag limits still? Eh, let's, let's say there, there, there is still. Okay. So you've got your deer, everybody's got your deer, you're, you're tagging out on day one. We're done, right? There's no money left. Nobody's going and buying more ammo. They're not going buying more guns. We're out. Bigger piece to that puzzle, right? So we don't have a chance to, to continue. Now let's say, you know, things change and there are no bag limits. And, and you know, you're out there and you're an unethical hunter. And, and I don't want to say always unethical, but you're, you know, you're, you're able to kill as much as you want, as many game animals as you want. Well, again, we deplete the population of game and the habitat suffer. And not only from those big game, but it's such a big ecosystem overall. You know, what's eating what out there? Um, um, what's, what animals might be secondary grazers right off of a rancher's field, right? Um, uh, second to their cattle. 
Um, I mean, it just, it, there is so much more toward conservation in the North American model of wildlife conservation that, that could be considered one of the backbone drivers of the United States. Um, uh, and, and I mean, the things that, 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 you know, everybody wants to do every, every year could be gone. And then billions of dollars in industry are affected. Um, jobs. Jobs. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's, it, What's, is it, it uh, snowballs. Is it almost 2 billion in Montana now? Dollars. I did read that. Was it 2.1? Yeah. Is that what I? It's up there. Yeah. I and mean, they were talking billions of dollars. Yeah, billions of dollars in outdoor recreation in the state of Montana alone. Um, and in fact, this particular year, I don't want to get too much into the COVID discussion, that there is a lot of fear in Montana of tourism coming in. Um, you know, we, we talk about the North American model of wildlife conservation. So that's Canada, US, Mexico, you know. Um, we work well with, with Mexico and Canada. Mexico doesn't have as as much game, um, and you know there might be different laws rega regarding firearms. Pittman Robertson does not; it's not them; it's the United States. But Canada, on the other hand, there's a lot of hunting in Canada. There's caribou, there's moose, there's elk, deer. You know, you you name it, muskox, right? Um, they've been drastically affected by the lack of people able to travel to Canada. Their their gross domestic product is suffering this year. Um, because hunting is is gone it's being taken away so you know as we talk about the ethics of hunting it, it's it's more than that you know that's kind of the, the the starting piece but then after that you get into where it hurts monetarily job loss families um, not just just money and families but but the um, the heritage of what these families are about um, you know a lot of the people I know that grew up hunting you know, they, they grew up with a sense of, of knowing what's right and wrong, you know, going out into the field with mom or dad or grandpa and sharing those stories and learning something. And, uh, you know, and as a kid, I hear a lot of them didn't want to go and hike the mountains, but now as an adult, that's what they do. And, and they, they take their kids and it's the most important part of their year. Um, so, so not only can we talk about this from a bigger, broader perspective, but from a personal perspective as well. Um, for those that don't hunt also, I'm going to, I'm going to flat out tell everybody here, I've never killed a big game animal. I, have I tried? <laughs> yeah, I've tried. <laughs> I'm just not very good at it. Um, <laughs> but I believe in it, you know, and a lot of times hunters, I think they, they miss, they misrepresent an opportunity to talk to anti hunters and, and hunters alike that, you know, you don't have to go out and hunt, but come with me, learn about the biology and what these animals are doing you know, um, where they're going to be. And, and hey, I'll take you on a good hike. If, if you've got some buddy that likes to run in the, the hills somewhere, you know, say, hey, would you rather go up and down a mountain with me? I could really use, use a packer, right? Um, and so it's, it is important. I think that, you know, one of the takeaways today, if I could say anything, is don't, don't believe that if somebody doesn't hunt, that they shouldn't know about hunting. They shouldn't believe in hunting. Um, a lot of hunters because anti-hunters can be pretty brutal, real, realistically. It's, it's, not a, it's not a fair shake out there, even though all of these reasons why hunting is good. Um, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people say killing an animal is bad, and it's really not. Um, it's a more humane way to, to harvest your, your meat in your freezer than, you know, a slaughterhouse. Um, it's, it's more organic than any of that, that can be. It's better exercise. Um, you know, I was disappointed when I asked my kid about hunting and he, uh, and I said, uh, uh, how do you get, how do we get our food? And he said, we drive because <laughs> we drive to the store. Um, but then there's hunters who they, they rely on that every year. Um, and they rely on, on the traditions, which are fair chase traditions, the ethical aspects. Um, and, and in this day and age, it's harder and harder to defend that people are out there hunting, uh, um, to feed the family. You know, it, it is more expensive than it's ever been to hunt. Um, Bullets are more expensive. Ammo's more, uh, or guns are more expensive. The gear is more expensive. It's harder to get to places. Gas is expensive. Um, uh, the United States doesn't log like it used to, um, so game is is having a harder time to 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 be seen. You know, the the wilderness is thicker. Um, it, Let's take a pause right there and do a quick question and answer. How many of you know somebody that's cost prohibited from hunting? 
In other words, they 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 might go with you, but they they can't afford the rifle, or they don't have the vehicle, or they can't afford the licenses. How many of you? Uh, let's go around the table. Tyler, do you know anybody like that? I sure don't. Um, everybody that I know or grew up with or related to or friends or acquaintances, that's what we all grew up doing. Whether you know, we um, go to deer camp in Minnesota, you know, northern Minnesota, and spend a week up, you know, deer hunting, but. Everybody I know, that's what their life revolves around ever since they were old enough to walk, you know, carry a BB gun with dad in the woods, so. Yeah, generational, sounds like, with Tyler. How about you, Ed? I know, well, Ed uh, sponsored a few hunters, so he knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm not sure what to say because sometimes somebody's, it's not like probably everybody on this call, unless they were, Got it, unless they're a trustafarian, has probably had uh, they've been short on cash <laughs> for for various reasons. You know, fortunately, right now I'm not in that situation. But um, you know, people have been good to me and giving me rides places, and you know, and I'm more than willing to share a box of ammo or say, here's you know, I'll pick up the gas this week and I'll come out and wash or you know. You're my hunting partner. No, let me buy your tags for you. I'll do that. You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you hear about people borrowing rifles until they get their own and things like that, too. So um, I've heard stories along the way. I know people along the way have told me stuff. So I didn't know I was going to get this question. <laughs> so, <That's right>. uh, <laughs> stumbling right. through it. Okay, well, Tim Johnson, you, you ever dealt with that issue? The reason I bring it up is I work with a lot of you. And a lot of those millennials don't have the money. They think they don't. They have the money for concerts, but other <laughs> pursuits. <laughs> but uh, what do you think, Tim? Is, have you ever heard that before? Yeah, I think um, I, I was just thinking, like, I, I just saw an ad for a, for a rifle, <clears throat> high-powered rifle, that was like, what was it, 300 bucks, uh, $350? I don't remember. I don't think the prices on some of these uh, – pieces of equipment have really changed all that much and the quality is, is pretty good too. So I, my perspective from an, from an educator's perspective, cause that's what I do for a profession yeah. um, is that we just haven't had in education, a lot of um, information shared about hunting gun safety when I was a kid. And I also grew up in Minnesota. So Tyler, you and I are Minnesota bound or Minnesota uh, influenced anyway. Um, anyway, the, uh, just the influence that schools have had um, when I was a kid and, you know, you hear stories of kids that uh, would go to school, put their gun on the front of the bus, get in the seat, go to school, come out of school, uh, get on the bus, grab the gun, go grouse hunting right after school. So there's just, and that's a cooperative thing. I mean, these kids are, are bringing their shotguns onto the school bus and, and certainly the culture has changed. There's no doubt about that either. <clears throat> um, but I think this is one of the effects of that. And I think, uh, um, I think that that opportunity piece is also a lack of opportunity to learn about it and to, to hear stories about it. So, yeah, yeah, the mentors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would say that uh, hunting is probably one of the most intimidating sports for anybody to, to want to join if they don't know anything about it, right? Firearm safety is involved. Um, the scariness of the wilderness, grizzlies, you know, who knows what their, their issues or their concerns might be. Um, but it is, it's one of the most intimidating sports to join. And if we could have more mentors, more people to educate and, and show the ease of it, you know, and it comes down to, you know, you become more proficient in things, you understand the ammo that you're buying every time, it does become easier and more manageable to, to afford. Um, but the entry levels for those who don't know anything, don't have a mentor, um, all they hear is the negativity toward it. You know, that's, that's why, you know, having these key pieces, again, going back to the, <laughs> um, going back to the, the, the fact that there, there are ethics involved is, is one of those defining pieces when you're, you're talking to a new hunter, you know, you tell them why it's important that as we go out into the field that we respect this land, the, the animals that we may harvest, the landowner, if you're out on somebody's property, um, it, because this it's it's getting harder and harder to keep it alive um and, and yet some of us take it a bit for granted uh, in in america the opportunities that we have 
I had a, a foreign exchange student from China that uh, his dad worked in the, over in China in the game department. And over there, it was, it was, you know, they were arresting people if they had guns. And, and so only the military had guns. And, and yet people would still find ways to go kill animals so they could eat. And, and so anyway, it was a diff completely different perspective for him, but he never had that opportunity. And so when he came and stayed with us and found out we were hunters, uh, he was pretty excited about that. So we got him through hunter safety course and got him his license and loaned him a gun. Money wasn't a thing for him, but uh, he, it was a big deal for him to get out and go hunting and to harvest his first deer and to go pheasant hunting and, and, and miss all day. You know, he didn't care. He was out having a good time. And, and so, um, you know, it's a little different perspective here in America. There's, you know, our culture is maybe moving away from that, but I think we take it a bit for granted that we have that freedom and that opportunity if we want it. I, I know as I'm older than a lot of folks, it, it's, uh, uh, maybe I don't, maybe the kids aren't, and you know, our millennials aren't thinking that way, but for me, it, it's, it's just been a given that I had that opportunity if I wanted to take advantage of it. He never had that, so it was pretty special to him. Yeah. Well, uh, two things on that. I talked to a parent yesterday. I volunteer at one of the schools here. And because of finance, we're talking about finances, uh, this COVID thing, he lost his job. He's in a tough situation. He had to sell a car just to make ends meet. He can't go hunt. He, I, I asked him, do you want to go this year? I can't. I can't afford it. I have to take care of my family. And so finances do get in there. And that's where Mr. Schiffer and friends come in. But the, the ethics thing covers everything we talked about with the bottom line of being financial. But but before we even get to the to the financial part of it, a, a whole gamut of things are affected. It, we mentioned them. We, we lose mentors. And that's why so many fewer kids are hunting now because there's no mentors or it's harder to get out to the field. If you have to go farther to hunt. It costs more time. So we're not going to do it like I used to do out the back door. So that's limited. If, if we don't have ethics, those ranchers aren't going to ask us or allow us to come on their property, which in turn doesn't help them because then their crops are eaten, their food's eaten that's meant for their animals. If, if we're not allowed to hunt or we have poor ethics, therefore we get a poor reputation, it's going to affect game management. And that's going to get out of hand. If we have a poor reputation because we're hunters, oh, hunters have guns. Guns are bad. Um, uh, the Second Amendment gets jeopardized because hunters are bad people. Right. They don't have ethics. There's a whole gambit of things before we even get to the dollar bill. And they all do affect the dollar. And, and we have to look at not the dollar. We have to look at the source of what's right and how do we make it right and how do we keep it right, how do we keep it ethical, then we don't have to worry about the dollar right. as much. And, and, and that's key. And there's a few ruin it for the majority when they don't close gates, when they shoot a cow or whatever. And it's up to the few of us somehow, some way, to make it easier, not so intimidating, to get into the field, to get into the acumen of picking ammo and picking hunting partners and, and being brave enough to knock on a door and ask for permission um, and not be scared of being turned down. Um, and, and there's fewer and fewer of old guys like you or maybe even me that are there and around to do it. Maybe some areas are easier because you're in the, in the rural country, but the bigger the cities get, the bigger the suburbs get, the fewer those people are in that congestion of people. So it, it, it's the ethical thing, the hard thing to do, and we need to look at how we maintain that before we look at the dollar. You're, you're right, and you hit a few, few nails on the head very, very well. You know, the, the ethical piece is, is the backbone to it all to defend us because, like you said, it is the reputation. And uh, what I wanted to get into, and, and I'm going to use this as a great segue, is the simple fact is, is you know, 
gun rights are getting attacked daily, right? But what is hard to attack? An ethical hunter, somebody that's doing it right for their families. You know, in, in this day and age, you know, gun rights are, are so intertwined with hunting. Um, uh, so gun rights are so intertwined with hunting that as soon as we have people disrespecting and, and misrepresenting the hunter's way of life, pretty soon the next attack is going to be easily hunting rifles. Um, it, 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 and if hunting rifles go away, the most modest, least um, intimidating type of firearm out there, I think, I mean, maybe 22, but uh, when, you, when you talk of modern sporting rifles, pistols, you know, anything like that, a hunting rifle is the most, most basic and most, most, well, not basic, but most modest. Um, and when those go away, then a lot of Second Amendment rights are going to trickle to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of confidence too when you're when you're taught ethics at a young age or old age when it comes to hunting, those go well beyond the field. You know, like you said, are you are you do you have the confidence to go knock on a door? Because maybe it's to ask for hunting permission, or maybe you did something that you're you shouldn't have. Maybe you accidentally shot something you shouldn't. You know, there's there's so many stories where somebody they'll 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 shoot a deer and they'll see it drop, and then they'll see that deer drop, jump up and they'll shoot again and it'll drop and then they'll go over there and they've dropped two deer. And now I was asked the other day this very question about this very scenario. Is that poaching? Is that bad? And realistically, you know, the answer from a lot of game wardens was it just depends on how you, you approach the situation. Accidents happen. If you meant to kill two deer, that's on you. But if you came up and you said right away, and that's most of what the ethics behind hunting are, is if you can if you can approach it with knowing that hey, if I did something wrong, I better say something, um, then you might even not even get in trouble for it because that's the right thing to do. People make mistakes, and and hunting is a hard thing. That's why we practice shooting. That's why we practice knowing what game we are are hunting, whether or not it's a mule deer or whitetail. You know. Um, it can, can be tricky for a lot of people. And, and I've found that the game wardens are far more understanding when, when you come to them with a situation. I, I saw a mule deer one year that had an arrow through its jaw and it was starving to death, but I didn't dare shoot it. I didn't want, it was a little, little dinky buck and it was in a place I didn't want to have to drag him out. And so I left him go knowing full well he's going to starve to death. And I go down through a game check station and I told the, the game board down there and he said, oh, you should have shot it and dressed it out and left it lay and then come and got us. And we would have taken, we could have let you have it or you could have taken it to, um, to donate the meat. But uh, they would have preferred that I had killed that deer huh? to save it from suffering and starving to death and, and possibly feed families with it at the same time. But I was nervous about shooting a deer that I didn't want to put a tag on. I could have put my tag on it, but I didn't want to. And, you know, so I wrestled with that a little bit. Had I not been so prideful, I probably would have tagged the little, little <laughs> guy. And, but, or maybe that was a year. It's been a number. It might have been a year where I'd already filled my new tag. So it's still so your So I would have been <laughs> poaching had I, had I shot that second deer. So there, there was a reason that, that I didn't shoot it rather than just not wanting to fill a tag. Typically, I would have done that. But um, anyway, it, it's my point is that the game wardens aren't always just looking That's to great. nail you over something that you do wrong. They, they want you to be trying and, and be ethical and uh, doing the right thing. And in that situation, they would have rather, like I said, they would have rather I killed that deer than yeah. well, save it suffering. And so often, a game warden will show up you know, to your campsite or whatnot. And, and, you know, it may, might be a bit intimidating because really they're looking for poachers. They're looking for bad guys, but they're also looking to see if anything's going on. Let's Where get, let's get Tim, then we'll get Jack. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Just a, <clears throat> something that I've personally made uh, an effort in, in how I talk about hunting. Um, and I think ethics is, is a great term. Ethics, in some ways for people is about rules and tends to be more black, black and white. I like the term steward. You know, we're a steward of these resources, which has a caretaker type of uh, 
connotation to it. And I would just encourage the use of stewardship more and more, uh, not only with, uh, you know, the hunting rights and, and the, the, the hunting culture that we love and adore, but even with the Second Amendment, we're, we're stewards of, you know, the people that are around us and the, and the community that we live in. We, we, we take care of these things. And I just think that's a, that's a powerful term. So I'm just throwing that out there for everybody. I like, I like steward. That's good. Jack, we'll get you now. now that, oh. If you Same accidentally second, kill something, you know, dress it up and go tell a game warden. He's not going to give you a ticket. He may give you a, um, a, a courtesy tag. Or, there's a name for it. I don't know what it is right now. But you're not going to do it. I don't, I've been, I've known people that one guy shot two moose, jumped, one, one went down and another jumped up. Same thing with an elk. Um, a guy shot an elk and one shot and two of them jumped dead. One knocked to the right and the bullet kind of hit the other elk. And, I, hmm. and people with getting two deer, um, and th they didn't get citations. And, or fines, more importantly. Yeah. You know, back on the ethics and the education thing, out where I live outside of town, there's two kids that walk around with 22 shooting ground for it. They walk up and down the road, they're safe, they're careful, and it bothers none of us. And one day I saw a car stop and I, they were standing there like this. So I stopped, said, hey guys, what's happening? And a lady from town who was driving out there, who was not familiar with the area, was giving them a riot act for walking down the road with guns without their parents and all this stuff. So it's just a, an example of lack of education and understanding of what can be instead of what can't be. And these kids were scared just but the whole neighborhood, everybody knows them, and we're perfectly fine. And that's the way it should be if we're properly educated. And this lady wasn't. Well, if we were, in just a second, Tyler, I'll get to you. If we were educated more on being stewards of, of ethical conservation, um, Tim, I, I really like that. Uh, I'm gonna use that. Um, you know, there, there'd be more confident and more knowledge for these people to educate those that don't know. You know, when all, all you've been taught is, you know, whack them, stack them, or flies a day, dies, crawls, it falls, you know, um, and, then, and then you have somebody like that getting upset with you, you can't educate them on, on the importance of, of what you're actually doing, you know, and sometimes even diving further into the science of, you know, there's too many ground squirrels, and we're getting rid of them for um, Joe Schmo landowner, right? So the more confident you can be in the ethics of, of hunting, the more appropriately you can defend it and the more you can, can help others be confident in it. Um, Tyler, I, I know you've had your hand up for a bit. You touched on the, and I think uh, Steve did well and Tim did as well, but like taking the second amendment for granted, uh, when I was living down in Florida, my, um, he's like a second dad to me. And he's retired special forces captain and his son was in the Navy and they were stationed in Japan. Well, they moved back and their teacher, their daughter's teacher wanted to come and visit. And we're standing in his yard and she's talking about, asked a question about guns. And she's like, can't never shot one. They, they're not allowed to have them. If they see you with a gun in Japan, you're basically shunned. I looked at my friend, the retired captain. And I said, um, go to your truck, grab your Mini-14, your AR, and a pistol. And you should have seen the, the smile on this lady's face. You know, something that we take for granted as Americans where we could just walk out and go shoot whenever we want to. She was so scared to pull that trigger the first time. She goes, nobody can take pictures, but I just can't get back. I mean, she's on the other side of the world. I mean, she was definitely afraid, but when she pulled the trigger, you couldn't have measured. There isn't a tape measure big enough to measure the smile on her face, you know? And so you guys all make good points about how we take something like that for granted, you know, because I look at this lady on the other side of the world, here she's visiting, and this is something so foreign to her that she never did. I mean, think of us as Americans to try something new that we've never had the opportunity to do. It has to be something pretty big because we have so much freedoms in this country, you know, so that's all I wanted to say. It's good. Uh, you know, it's been a part of the way of life for us for so long. You know, I, I'm 
feeling like I'm one of the last generations where there were generations of hunters, right? It, it feels more and more like friends here in Missoula have no I idea, you know, what, can I kill an elk here, a deer here? Uh, what birds can I, you know, they just don't, they don't know. Um, it's just getting further and further and, and it's, it's a population issue, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of reasons for the inabilities to get out. Um, and, and the more we spread ourselves as humans, the human nature to, to grow, um, the less habitat there's going to be for these animals. Again, the notion that selectively hunting, you know, ethical hunting, choosing the right animal that's right for you, um, knowing your limits of, of not only just the laws, but the limits of your shot and your, your competencies, um, will will keep those areas able to, to have sportsmen coming to it often and time and time again. And, and pretty soon, you know, you've got like the Elk Foundation um, securing millions of acres of habitat that, that couldn't have been done without hunters believing and, and sharing that to the next generation and the next generation um, of the importance of that. You know, it, and it's interesting that the, it wasn't always this way, this, this con concept that, that, um, that we take it for granted, uh, realistically. So I, I'm going to give a little more history on Boone and Crockett. And I, I was trying to get through it as quickly as possible to get through the ethics. But, you know, Boone and Crockett's really well known for records, right? The records of North American big game. If you get a Booner, you know, you're, you're one of the very, very, very low percentages of hunters to ever do that. It, it's not, it's not, you know, a guy with a million bucks able to pay for that animal. It's could be anybody. It, it, it's anybody, you know, we had our, our 30th awards recently and you should have seen the, the range of people um, that might have walked out their back door and got a booner or might have been, you know, chasing an elk for years and finally got him. Um, but it wasn't always that way. So the reason they actually established the records was game were coming back. They were starting to thrive. Every once in a while, somebody would get something so tremendously huge that, that you know, it, it needed to be categorized and needed to be. And now you you skip forward so far you know because at that time game weren't it was new that game were coming back and becoming abundant and very exciting so that's where the records came out really and and they wanted to create a a, a, a scientific set to show you know originally the the numbers were um uh, the measurements were just to to measure what the game that was going to vanish um the size of it you know have something scientific to to go by and then later it started to become a, a more scientific purpose to measure um, the spread, the, the beams, the, you know, uh, all, all of it. Um, and uh, would, you, would you say that this, uh, this measuring system that we have uh, developed here through Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, uh, that it's to document a, uh, a healthy, Heard and where those are located? Uh, slightly, slightly yes, uh, slightly no. So um, today's use is really a benchmark for, for habitat health. And, and so how healthy a herd is, that could mean that if they get a bunch of records that are suddenly way better, they want to see what's happening in that particular state, you know, or county, or why, why are a bunch of records coming from this? If suddenly the records drop down, you know, it, it could mean some, some varying factors that they want to look at. Um, a lot more universities even are using the data. We've got Jack Renault here that, that was the director of Big Game Records, the first director actually of Big Game Records. And, um, and he's seen the records, more records than anybody. Um, but we're now in this state, he's collected so much that, that universities are using it to cross collaborate research of, of you know, from temperatures mixed with the, the records and, and what variables um, they can find there. I mean, all sorts of really amazing things. It's taken about a hundred years to collect that much data um, to be usable and to be big enough um, that, that, you know, it, it really does, it, it goes further than just the records. But anyway, going back to the, 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 the people, um, uh, anyway, so going back just a little bit that, that concept to have those records, um, not only now is used as a wildlife data set, um, but we're, we're kind of taking for granted the fact that it just, it, hunting is a part of it. You know, it, we, we went to a point where it was taken for granted and they could kill everything to, 
hey, we need to save and get these animals back to suddenly everybody was coming back. Uh, veterans were coming back from wars and they knew in the United States they could hunt. And it became a very popular thing, a very, very popular thing. And now we're at a point where, yeah, people are taking it for granted a little bit more than, than what we'd like. Um, so there's been shifts and, and right now we're at kind of one of those downslope shifts. And it's really up to, to hunters and sportsmen to back it up and try to keep the next generation going and be mentors if you can be. Um, uh, instigate the conversations to get more people hunting. Um, and uh, I feel like we're, we're in the need for, for some dialogue or questions. I know we've got Tyler, Tim, and Ed. Is, is David, Sam, or, or anybody, Garrett, you got, Heather, you want to make a, a comment on ethical hunting? This is Garrett. So I kind of had a question for you. Um, you know, we talked about how um, our, you know, licenses and tags and stuff go to, go to support conservation. It seems like there's been a shift from, uh, I guess, studying and protecting healthy populations of elk and deer in the game that we go after to protecting and studying the predators. It just seems like in the state and federal um, agencies that they're more concerned about predators nowadays and studying them than they are the big game that we, you know, we really look forward to going after. Do you have any opinions on that? Fuzzy animals are cute, Garrett. Fuzzy animals are, people like fuzzy animals. You know, don't kill the bear, don't kill the wolves. Um, it, is it correct um, from what I feel like wildlife management perspective? No, not always. Um, rarely, especially the reintroduction, a lot of these wolves into places that I, they really shouldn't be. Um, the fact that grizzly bears are now in a lot of areas like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, um, really problem bears, there's more attacks than there's ever been. There's more, more dumpsters dumped, you know, there, there's just more prevalent. Um, and, uh, and then suddenly they were allowed to be hunted because there was just too many. The carrying capacity was overloaded and it was just too dense with grizzly bears. Montana is hugely dense with grizzly bears, but the agency, well, and the agency said, it's time to hunt these. Based on science, it's time to hunt these. Well, judges got involved and, and, and people that might not have had, had quite a scientific management background got involved and decided that public opinion was going to decide that those can't be hunted. And, and, you know, the fact is, is now there's, I, what I feel is too many grizzlies in that area. And, and what that affects is not just, you know, too many grizzlies. It doesn't just affect humans. It's the animals that are competing for food. It's the, the grubs. It's the, you know, it, it, it goes down the list in the ecosystem. And that's why we really, really encourage to, again, always be ethical hunters, but to back scientific wildlife management. There's a reason for it. They're not trying to, to kill every grizzly bear in the world. Um, but if that kind of answers, Garrett, I know that's kind of my opinion more than anything of those state agencies doing that, you'd be surprised. A lot of state agencies, um, that not all of them feel that that's the right thing to do. Um, and a lot of times it's lobbyists, not necessarily the state agency. Not every time, I don't wanna put everybody into one bucket always, it's not the case. Just like ethics, it's not always black and white. Um, but I, I, that's kind of what I feel is that people just think that, you know, the Native Americans, um, they, they, they worship the grizzly, you know, they, they believe in the grizzly and, and so they lobby to keep the grizzly, you know, things like that, where it's again, public opinion to, to make those decisions more than it, more than it should be. Yeah, it seems like it's got more feel good than scientifically, you know, based, because we'll talk to, and I know Sam Rosling knows him as well, is we'll, we'll talk to the, the bear specialist in our area. There's only 53 grizzlies in, you know, the Cabinet Mountains, and they're all, they're all collared. Well, no, <laughs> if you actually go out in the woods and spend time out there, you can tell there's more than 53, and no, they're not all collared. And so there just seems to be this disconnect with what people see in the woods, versus what agencies seem to be reporting as numbers and and things like that and so 
Right. And, and, you know, I apologize if there's any ever any disrespect toward any, you know, group that does believe that these animals should be reintroduced, um, preserved, protected, things like that. It's just that, you know, when when you have such a, a, a big cycle or, or circle of conservation, if you will, um, it, it, you, you can't just suddenly pull out pieces and decide scientific wildlife management isn't appropriate. You know, it's the scientific wildlife management that demands the selective hunting. And in order to be appropriate selective hunters, we have to be ethical and, and make choices when we're out in the field and we can't just go in, in wanton waste of, of animals. Um, and I think also as, as we're, we're talking to a lot of veterans, you know, it, veterans carry a sense of confidence when they speak, you know, um, if, if it, I, I don't think that that's untrue by any stretch of the means. And a lot of times speak with such conviction that, you know, these are the sorts of messages that if, if, you know, more veterans and people in general, but really those that can speak with such conviction can, can really promote fair chase and ethical hunting. It'll go and it'll go and it'll, it'll snowball and, and pretty soon you'll have more public opinion backing science rather than backing feel good. So that's a, that's a great question, Garrett. Thank you. And, and, and one thing to add to that is, is I know Jack wants to say something, but real quick, I got to get it in. You're going to forget it. Oh, my <laughs> no, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> you already brought it up. First of all, there's a big difference between conservation and preservation. Conservation is wise use. It was, that concept was founded by a Boone and Crockett Club member by the name of Gifford Pinchot. Um, why did you, but you know, prior to the Boone and Crockett Club, 200 years, hunting was a 24 hours a day, 365 days a year proposition. People had to learn. They saw the, the Boone and Crockett Club members, a lot of them had been out west hunting elk. They, they had the wherewithal and the means. And then when they, you know, in the early 1800s, then when they went out in the late 1800s, all of a sudden, a lot of the animals where they hunted were gone. And so they, they decided, okay, let's talk about conservation and not preservation. And, and the Endangered Species Act, for example, with grizzly bears, the whole idea of the, the Endangered Species Act is to bring these animals back so that we can hunt them. And again, um, unfortunately, some people want to stockpile. There's a lot of terms here that, that go with this. And stock, you can't stockpile animals. And, you know, like grizzly bears, they, they have their own ranges and they, they protect their habitat where their range, open, you know, their ranges where they go. They don't want other grizzlies in. So what happens? They push them out on the prairie, you know, each other. So there's, um, I'm just touching on a couple of things. There's yeah. a lot of thought here. Well, and this gets back to a little bit more about our organizations at Montana Veterans Association and USA. We are a market-based management company, and we believe in challenge culture and knowledge share. That's actually part of our document. So you're expected to knowledge share. Now, one of the things that you find in the hunting and sportsman community is this concern that I think it was Garrett that just raised, right? Is okay, your study may guide a whole region of grizzly bear management, right? Or mountain lion management. That is not matching, as we heard from ranchers last year, our anecdotal experience in the field. And so your study trumps what our boots on the ground are seeing. Good old flagpole versus boots on the ground. Every veteran will understand that, right? And so we have to come to a system where we value the public input and the boots on the ground intelligence. So when we say science driven, yes, but we don't, there's a kind of a new movement out there, especially led by vets that we want to encourage. And I'll tell you, FWP, especially with the governor's race on the line, not to bring politics in, but sometimes politics does drive decisions and, and money as well. And we got, the governor's race going on where FWP leadership may change, the NRC leadership may change. 
And the, the movement I'm seeing is a lot more towards knowledge sharing and let's listen to the organization. Let's listen to some sports. Let's listen to some ranchers. So you get more of a multi-use access, multi-knowledge. Does that make sense? Because there are fears out there of, man, a study is just going to drive everything. In my opinion, don't count. My, what I'm seeing in the field doesn't count. We have ranchers that are all over Steve and I about that. That they, they uh, uh, what's the best way to summarize it? Well, they, they, they thought they were light. Yeah. You know, their, their experience, they, they used to winter, and not so many years ago, they would winter several hundred, five, six hundred head of elk on their ranches. And the fishing game at their meetings are saying, well, there's, there's 1,200 elk in your area. And, and they would see 20 to 30, groups of 20 to 30 that would move through. Mm -hmm. and, and, they're, you know, and they would acknowledge that it's not just the wolves, but the grizzly bears and the mountain lions that are that are eating these things or changing their patterns, you know, they, they've moved them out of their normal patterns at a minimum and likely have impacted the herd numbers more so than what the, uh, the fish and game folks were acknowledging. And, you know, they they live it every day, you know, and a lot of the game wardens do too, but these ranchers know what they, what especially some of the older ones that have been around for yeah. 70 years. They know what they see out there. Now, having said that, there's conversely the other side of that. Some ranchers live in a bubble. Some of us on Facebook live in a bubble. Some of us sportsmen that think we know everything learn something new every year, right? <laughs> I do. Absolutely. And so, you know, fish and game may be seeing trends that the, the one ranch of 100 acres or 800 acres is seeing, right? So we have to be careful to go too far either way. All I'm saying from our program perspective is we strongly believe in knowledge. And, and yes, the science driving decision making of wildlife management, right? But as much knowledge. And, and you know, I might expand on this uh, quite a bit, hopefully. Um, yeah. We're the Boone and Crockett Club has a ranch up near Depoy or Montana. Um, and there was decisions that were made quite a while ago to actually lower the AUM, the number of cattle you can have on a, I forget what the acronym is. And we're now doing studies to determine, you know, is that actually accurate? You know, so a lot, sometimes, even though we may back things, you don't know what that might happen down the road. And Test now, and, and, and now we're trying to work with ranchers to figure out, you know, can, can we get more lease, can we get more cattle on a lease piece of property from the government than what you are allowing? Because a number of years ago, a law was passed and it seemed to lower that number for ranchers. So oftentimes though we say we back the wildlife management, it's, it's a sound science that we want to be able to, to, to have in our back pocket. But sometimes though, talking to the local communities and that's why every state has their own individual laws. And I, I, shouldn't, <clears throat> I should expand a little bit on the notion of conservation versus preservation, Jack. Yeah. I was thinking about that today and, and I would have forgotten, so thank you. Um, and, and the reason I want to expand on that is, is conservation is the wise use of land, right? So that could be, you know, science-based, um, but it could come down to just the simple fact that, you know, um, maybe it just needs log because there's just way too many fires, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of reason. But now preservation, though, you're preserving something. You're not touching it. And that's where the American... The, the, you know, the North American model of wildlife conservation, what we have in the United States is so important because if we didn't touch it and we preserved it, one, it, we, it would do whatever it wanted, right? Maybe there'd be wildfires, maybe there wouldn't, maybe animals would go extinct, uh, you know, you just, you just watch it and, and you never get use of it. And that's where it's a, an amazing thing that we are, are lucky to have here is that we can use that land there's a reason that there's funds for roads to go into there. There is uh, wise uses also logging. Um, it, it's monetary. Um, it's, it's, um, it's. Go to bed, Lene. <laughs> go to bed. We can hear you. We can hear you. You need to be on mute. <laughs> um, I hope my kids are in bed, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, um, 
yeah, so so there is, I mean, if I could say anything today too, one of the biggest takeaways is that knowing what's conservation, what is is utilizing the resources, not just to, to make money and to keep that cycle going so that we can keep having good habitats and health, but also the, that's also the recycle or the renewable use of, of the game animals. You know, if there, there's science behind how many animals you can kill for, for if it's male or female, gender-based, to keep the carrying capacity where it needs to be. Um, so again, wise use of those, those resources. Um, maybe it is utilizing forest land for, for um, cattle to graze on. It, it, you know, so, so if you can take anything away, conservation and preservation are two very, very distinctly different things. Preservation and, you so know, yellow- profits involved in both? Somewhat involved, more, uh, much, much, much more conservation. But there are times where, you know, it, it, to preserve a, a geyser, um, for example, would be, you know, though we're, we're a hunting-based conservation organization, that's, that spans to the habitats those animals are in. You know, it, it would be no stretch of the imagination to assume that you, we might be talking about climate change soon, just from the simple fact of, of animals and where to place, you know, solar panels and things. Um, it, it expands much, much further into every aspect of what people don't realize. And, you know, and that's a whole nother topic that we could talk about all night long. I mean, um, and I don't want to get off topic with climate change. Don't, don't go there, but it's a good <laughs> example of, of, you know, one of those outlier scenarios that conservation will play a part in. Um, and I have an example of a, of a, a major failure of preservation. It didn't happen in America, but in America, we recognize that, that uh, economies drive wise decisions, you know, um, but and in, not wise uh, and unwise. <laughs> but when it comes to wildlife management, if, if somebody else out there owns it, and they have a vested interest in keeping it alive. Um, they tend to stay alive. Um, but in Africa, in Uganda, I believe it was, I'm pretty sure there's can't remember the name, the major national park has a huge population of African lions, and there's no hunting in that national park. Outside the national park, all these farmers and ranchers have their cattle, and the lions come out of the park and eat the cattle. And the ranchers, for years, they were allowed to sport hunt the lions that came out of the park. Um, and so they would sell these hunts for fifty, hundred thousand dollars to allow folks to come over on their ranches and kill an African lion. Well, lions are territorial. So if there's a lion in zone A, other lions don't come in there. They stay in their zone. Well, when you have lions outside the park, the lions that are inside the park tend to stay in the park. And the ranchers were encouraged to allow the lions outside the park because they can sell the hunts and make money. And so if they donated, you know, 15, 20 head of cattle a year to be able to sell a fifty hundred thousand dollar lion hunt, it was a, it was a good <clears throat> economical decision for them. Well, the <clears throat> I forget which American, I, I, could, I mean, I could just say it's a Sierra Club, but it might be something else pushed a major lobbying effort into the Ugandan government and passed a law that they could no longer sport hunt African lions. So all these ranchers lost that source of income. They couldn't sell those hunts anymore, but they could still kill lions for killing their cows. That's always been part of the deal, the, the depredation hunts. They could still kill the lions. So what they do? They killed all the lions outside the park. Well, in the vacuum of the lions outside the park, all the lions inside the park started to expand their territory, came outside the park and got killed. More lions inside the park expanded their territories, came outside the park and got killed. Pretty soon, the population of lions, even inside the park, was so low that they feared that those lions were gonna go extinct in that area. And that genie is out of the bottle and they can't put it back. So there's no lions outside the park and, and dangerously low populations inside the park. 
because they took away an economic incentive to allow the lions to exist outside the park. And, and so it's one of those, you know, kind of the law of unintended consequences. You right. think you're that's doing exactly. something good and it turned around and backfired. And, and, and that's, I just find that as, as a preser an example of preservation failing its objective in a major significant way. And, and it could happen too. You know, we, we try to make these decisions now that are going to be wise in a year, five years, 10 years. And sometimes realistically, just like those benchmarks of the records at Boone and Crockett, sometimes mm -hmm. it shows a, a lesser quality habitat. Um, and that does happen. Uh, and it does. You know, one of the worst things that happened to hunting was not, not too long ago, and that was the Cecil the Lion debacle. Um, you know, we could go into the ethics and, and unethical nature of that, you know, shooting behind a fence, the animal had no chance of escape, all of that. Um, Garrett, he was a fluffy animal, um, looked good in pictures, and, uh, and that caused a whole lot of, 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 of snowball to go down the hill and, and so then later, a year or two later, Namibia, for example, started asking all, all out-of-country hunters to not post a single field photo of the game they harvest, which was a great marketing piece for them. But they were getting attacked so heavily by the United States. Namibia, a different country than ours, they do what they want, was getting attacked by our people. And it hurt their gross domestic product by... I, I don't want to assume a number, but it was a big number. And, and that's, that was sad. And a lot of times guys will go over there. I, you know, maybe they've saved up their whole lives to go on an elephant. Hunt. Maybe it's a, it's a, you know, a Friday afternoon, you know, paycheck, who knows, but they might go on this, this African elephant hunt, harvest an elephant. And they've not only given that country and that local community tens of thousands of dollars, They've also fed a, a tribe usually, um, and, and it's no it's it's no surprise that that gets so overlooked when people say, "Oh, they shouldn't be killing those elephants." Well, that elephant was also actually past its prime. He was older than he needed to be. He was he um, he was uh, what is it when you can't have kids anymore? What is sterile. It? He was sterile. Thank you. <laughs> he was sterile, and he was beating up on all of the younger, less mature bulls, and uh, and he needed to go. And that caused an uproar in the United States um, of, of what a country decided to do to get rid of a problem and to take care of its own. It already yeah. passed on his genetics. Yeah, it, Jack, as Jack said, he already passed on his genetics. And that's a part of what the selective hunting going after a mature male specimen, when you're able to get one that's big enough, you know, and old enough, um, is great for the record book. You know, it's exciting. Um, but it's really about that animal. And, and, and ultimately, you know, those guys that are trophy hunting, looking for the biggest and best, they are looking for that most mature, probably pass his prime, probably spread his genetics. And it's time. And, and he's become a problem. Maybe he can't even eat anymore that year. I mean, and it happens so quickly, um, you know, losing teeth um, that you're, you might even be doing him a favor. A lot of these, these record book animals that we see are actually, you know, the, the story of, of how old they are, they weren't going to last a lot longer than that. And, uh, and there's something to be said about trying, you know, defending the notion of trophy hunting. Who cares that that guy is searching for something big and he's paying money or gal is paying money for it. And it, it's a part of the process. And I might be doing it because I want meat. He might be doing it because he wants a big antler. And and wants to tell that story for the rest of his life. Um, but he's also helping contribute to conservation. And, and probably herd management. And herd management, yes. And taking out the young, immature males um, that haven't really had a chance to display their genetics yet, or and then certainly pass them on. You know, the, the big mature bucks and, and bulls have done that. But um, if you take those young ones out pretty soon, and, and a lot, you know, I'm I'm happy with every 13 year old kid out there shooting a little fork and horn buck. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, get started somewhere. But when you have the, you know, the more seasoned hunters like Jack and I, um, waiting on the the big trophy, and passing on all these other bucks, there there's more opportunity for that genetic diversity to build and to 
you know, for the for the healthiest ones to really establish themselves. You know, and as we pass on bucks, we I've gone seasons where I didn't harvest anything because I didn't see anything big enough. And you know, it, it is a bit of a herd management mentality as well. Yeah. In addition to just wanting something to hang on the wall. <laughs> right, right. And you know, and as you're out there, you're searching for that animal that you want. That's a, a personal decision of your own. And you get to see so many other animals and you get to experience it out there too many times. Hunting gets straight to the end, you know, straight to what you killed. And it's not about that. It's about the journey to get there. And almost every great hunting story uh, you, you ever read, it, it's about what it took to overcome, achieve, and, and, and hopefully succeed. And, and to, be, to be, you know, humble and, and to provide yourself with some humility if you aren't able to, to harvest something you know, you tried and you didn't, you didn't beat yourself up over it. You know, there's so many mental things that go along with it that, um, that, that it's important to take along the, along the journey to take time to consider what you want out of it and maybe to let game pass. I said earlier, I haven't killed a big game animal. I've let some pass. I've missed some shots. I'm embarrassed to say, but you know, I, and most of the time yeah. I just like being out there with my friends, my family. Uh, I mean, realistically, I, I, Actually, one year I didn't even pack a gun. I just wanted to go out, you know, and go see the animals, take pictures, you know, all the, the gamut. That's a part of it. And, and, and too often, like I said, we get to the end and we think that's all it's about. And then people that don't hunt, that's all they think it's about. It's not about that. It's about the journey to get there. Um, yeah, and you're helping the whole way, too. One of my funnest years hunting, three years ago, I legitimately had 24 different whitetail bucks I could have shot legitimately could have killed any one of them. I didn't shoot a one. I came home, had tag soup that year. <laughs> but I saw more game. I was out hunting a lot. And it was just exciting being out there. And I, what the Indians call it, counting coup. You know, <laughs> it's like, I could kill you. I could kill you. But I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. And, and that was, it was fun. You know, going trophy hunting and going empty handed was, I had more fun than, than on some years when I, you know, you shoot the first buck you see just because you need to meet the freezer. Right. That's not so much fun. No. But I spent the whole season looking at deer. And it was a good time. Absolutely. Yeah. Tyler. Let's get some interaction from the zoo. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. All right, so question for you. Um, maybe the other gentleman that's with you with uh, Boone and Crockett, but didn't you guys come out recently, something about those trail cameras that transmit the pictures directly to your phone? And if, do you know what I'm talking about, like those spy links that send them directly to your phone? Yep. And can you just touch on that a little bit too? Because uh, um, maybe that might, you know, play into the ethics as well, because I mean, if you're sitting in your house and you got a trail camera out there and all of a sudden you're getting a live picture of that animal right there, what's to say you just can't walk out there? And then let's say you do shoot a record book animal that's per, or excluded now from the record books if you're using one of those cameras, correct? Right. So it's kind of the same. So modern trail cameras, a lot of time now can transmit live video and images and audio immediately in real time and so it's kind of the same concept of a two-way radio system where you know you're guiding your buddy over to the next ridge and 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 frankly speaking it's it's illegal in most states i think arizona maybe you can still but and with people cell phones it's hard to it, it it's it's easier and easier to do that and not get caught i would say um, but it's the same concept that, that you're basically transmitting an immediate image telling you, I need to go over there to that spot because there is a big deer and I know he's there. He's two miles away. I'm, I'm going to get in the truck and I'm going to go, right? It's incredibly unfair advantage to the game. Yes, you might be in your tree stand. You might look on your phone and see, okay, I got to get to my other tree stand. Yeah, you might have had to hike over a ridge and you still have to be pro a proficient shot. You might still have to stalk. Um, but essentially it's kind of, it's, it's telling you exactly where animals are and that's goes against the notion of what sport, uh, sporting advantage is. 
you're not giving the animal a sporting advantage when, when you've got something, you know, if you're tracking it in, in such a way. What if a guy has 100 trail cameras all over the place and he's watching from spot to spot? Oh, he went there, not over to that one. He knows right where he's at. And so Boone and Crockett Club came out with that um, because we're trying to, to adapt to new technologies because that's new and, and they're becoming more prevalent. Yeah, a lot of people have those trail cams and game cams on their private property um, in order to just see game and, and spot. Um, a lot of the writers that, that write about it these days, they talk about the use of them. But you, you realistically, it, it, it shouldn't be allowed that you just know exactly where game are or you've got your buddy up on a ridge, you know, saying, OK, go, go right, go right, you know, guiding you exactly to them. There's well, no, there's no fair chase in that. But well, they don't allow you to fly and hunt the yes. same day. Yeah, so that you're not scouting. You, you know, can't drone and hunt. And yeah, it's kind of like the dark money hunt. Yeah, it is like the dark money hunting. <laughs> yeah. mean, you know, it happens out there and it creates a huge advantage. But is it ethical? Right. You know, is it right? And some might argue, is that any less ethical than than pulling up to the rancher's house and him saying, yeah, they're go over that hill that's where they're they're bedded right. down tonight or you sending me a text message with a picture of a big bull bedded down below you, you've already tagged out so come right here to yeah could that be that's where the ethics come in yeah. not so it much the it law. wouldn't be legal and eligible for him to it would not be legal right right well it depends on so in it depends on the state so always follow your state regulations um, another one of those complex, uh, another one of those complex components of hunting. Um, uh, no, it would not be uh, eligible to be entered into the Boone and Crockett records, um, which would be a real sad thing if you did get a, get something big enough to be entered. Um, and we do appreciate and respect the the honesty that people can provide us. Um, it is important. It's about the animal. Now, I I think though they could still enter the animal, but they could not have their name in that book in the book is that I'm not sure. okay so so often you know the the records is not about the hunter you know it's not about putting your name next to it which a lot of people nowadays it's been around so long it's like winning the lottery you know and you get some you want your name in the book right um well, but some money involved too and some of those antlers sell for 100 300 grand some antlers do they they uh, sell for good money like Bass Pro and... yeah oh yeah yeah, and then a lot of these hunters become kind of pseudo celebrities yeah. for a short while too. Um, it, it's easy for somebody to not to want or to have the desire um, if they already have kind of an an unethical notion to to the way of life. It's easy for somebody to find that doing that to get that large animal could benefit them, as as Sam said, monetarily speaking, um, publicity speaking. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons. Is it right? No, it's not right. It's one of those things, again, where ethics is up to the individual to choose what's right and wrong. Um, is it right to say you can and can't use trail cams? It's up to you, but technically speaking, we had to draw a line in the sand when it comes to a record that that is not fair chase, and it's up to your state to tell you whether or not it's legal and illegal. Um, yeah, trail camera pictures of that bull are cool. We've got a curriculum on it through our, unit, or through our programs, right? The whole trail camera curriculum um, we promote. Um, but we don't agree with the live streaming of, of the images and to get an immediate response and know immediately where that animal Does is. Does that answer your question, Tyler? Any debate or disagreement? No, that, that's all. I, I just wanted to hear that on that, that answered it. That's yeah. a great one, too, to debate. I mean, if anybody feels differently, I, I won't argue with you. I'll, I'll... Jack will. I just want Jack to... will. <laughs> I want to tell you about something that we had to deal with at Boone okay. and Crockett Club a few years ago. All right. And a guiding and outfitting ranch, they set up a, a camera with a computer, and you could sit in your bedroom in New York City and shoot an animal by sighting in with the, um, the equipment that they had. All you had to do was log on. Uh, you didn't even have to get out of your slippers and pajamas, shoot the animal, and then ship it to you. Well, it was made unfair chase. What? I don't even understand the appeal of that. 
there, there no, really isn't. Um, <laughs> there's people that will pay for it. For Tyler, go ahead. He's got a question. Yeah, see, I, I know what they're talking about because I know there was some like some hunts that like these terminally ill kids or these kids that are like wheelchair bound or people that are wheelchair bound that, you know, may have always wanted to shoot a deer, but they're just not physically able to. So I know they have that, they do that for some of those kids as well, or, you know, adults as well, where, you know, they can um, either blow into that, into that thing that actuates the trigger, or they can, you know, hit the mouse button and someone in the blind, you know, basically pulls the trigger. And to see a smile, I mean, in that case, I think it's all right, because I mean, the smile's on their face because they're not able to get out, you know, like the rest of us are. So... But I mean, like if you have a, an outfitter, you know, doing it to regular people, yeah, that's probably not right either. No, you're you're absolutely right. You know, there are, there are instances where these types of rules don't apply to the average hunter, the average Joe. You know, those that are are, are have accessibility issues. You know, they should have the opportunity to use what they can in order to experience the same thing that we're doing, and and. and and like Steve said, you know, it's exciting to see a, a young 13 year old shoot a little fork and horn where maybe somebody else might let it pass. It's, you know, every decision kind of is, is a little different. If it means that it's going to allow hunters to hunt um, when they regularly couldn't, there are exceptions to those rules. And, and that's a good one. That's thinking outside of the box too, because, you know, you don't get that question a lot, but when it comes down to it and if you ever were as you guys are all mentors or, or becoming mentors or, or you know being bigger part of this um you know you're going to get asked and you're going to get asked more and more by those that uh want you know those that don't have the chance to do these things they have the desire to do them more than the guys and gals that are taking it for granted and and again there's some economic uh, impacts in some states allow high fence hunting uh, Boone and Crockett doesn't register those those animals. I don't think Pope and Young does. Pope either. and Young doesn't yeah. either. But uh, there's a market for uh, well fed, well nourished. You know, in in Texas, there's a lot of high fence hunting. Um, people fence them in. Maybe they bring in some genetics, but they they certainly provide the nourishment to grow extraordinary antlers uh, on on their deer, and. Uh, you know, a lot of hunters don't see that as unethical. They see that as an opportunity. Um, a lot of us might turn our nose up at it, but uh, it's legal in the state of Texas. Uh, it, but I, I, re I appreciate that Boone and Crockett doesn't, you know, that's not a natural animal. That, that animal has been cultivated, if you will. Yes. Is everyone and, familiar with high fence hunting? Yeah. And there's What's no limit on the size of the high fence area. Yeah. Question? Your comment? average Montana hunter is going to consider that legal. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Question or comment? Yep. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, first of all, I know that uh, like game hunting now, like these game ranches, you know, are now pretty much defunct in Montana, but there are a tremendous number of people moving in buying up farmland and seeing, I see housing developments and I can't believe what I've seen between Ennis and Virginia City a couple of years ago. Some of the where you know, maybe you could have hunted out in a farm field years ago, but now you can't because smack dab between two big sections are maybe thirty or forty six or seven hundred thousand dollar homes in a little development in the middle of, you know, which used to be nowhere. And um, I think that's one of the problems. And maybe in Texas, that high fence hunting may make sense, but we've got a lot of public land here. And when you were talking about the grizzlies expanding out in the greater Yellowstone system, that's one of the arguments is that as more people move in, there's gonna be more grizzly and human interaction. And this is covered in field and stream and outdoor life too. And, and uh, I don't know what as conservationists we can do about that because if some farmer or rancher wants to sell their land or the inheritors of it do you know that's um i see so you know this this is this is an issue so we need to preserve i think public lands and um what 80 percent of montanans believe that we should keep public lands public and um 
but I don't, but I don't know what to do about people moving in. You know, it's like, yeah, I'd like my little piece of paradise too, but here I am. So I'm just saying it. And if somebody wants to respond to that positive, negative, let's, let's go for it. There you go, Tyler. <laughs> just one second. We've got Karen. Ask, uh, she's had her hand up for a minute. Okay. There's not public land in Texas. Um, if you don't have a deer lease and if you don't have a ton of money to go to somebody's private land, you don't hunt. You, there you is public lands. You're saying not a there's not a lot. Not a lot. Very, yeah. very little. And yeah. Texas is a big state, so it takes yeah. a while to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually. You don't private yeah. leases. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they're and they're, so they yep. that's, so it's pay to play though. It's pay to play. Yeah. And that's kind of goes into that notion earlier. You know, we we're so spoiled up here and lucky that we have so much public land and access to it. And, you know, and that's the, the driving force of the beginnings of conservation, that there was less and less and less land as people would head out west. But um, but uh, so then we were faced with talking about, well, is it expensive or not? No, it's not that expensive. Well, you go to Texas and it's thousands of dollars to get a lease. Um, and you know, and, and a lot of Texans, they understand that in, in those high fence situations, that, that might not be a record Boone and Crockett animal um, or not be allowed to be entered. And, um, and, and what I can say on that that Steve mentioned a minute ago is one of the biggest reasons, not only is it not fair chase, because what if that animal's trapped behind a fence? He's got nowhere to go, right? Um, but also the genetic material, a lot of times with these, these um, breeding facilities and these high fence where they're, they're encaged, is they're trying to grow the biggest and best. This is not a natural growth. It does not create a natural benchmark of where these animals are at and going because they're controlling it. Um, so we didn't feel that that was right to be able to allow them to be entered into a book when it's, it's you know, farm fed and grown. Um, to your point, Ed, about the Montana's, um, Montana, my, my bank calls it CCBs, cash, California cash buyers right now. And it's, <laughs> it, it, that's what's happening across the state. Yeah, and Dave, and Dave um, had a comment about there's a Texan in Sanders County right now, but this is, I think this is a phenomena all over and the cities are spreading out and then you've got these housing developments and then you have some rich landowners too. And, um, it's like poor city development. I'm, I, I've got a lot of comments that I have made about the development that's going on inside Missoula city limits, but some of this is expanding out too, where it's bad city planning, I think, or bad county planning. Um, and it's not, and a lot of people who are on our, like I would say on our county commissioners and city council, they want, you know, open space and a whole lot of other things, but yet, you know, they're, they, they're doing things to me that just kind of keep it clean, screw up. Um, you know, they're, you know, it's a hodgepodge. Uh, I, I think people know what I'm talking about. It's, like a checkerboard, it's a, a, ga a, a game of checkers that nobody's actually going to end up winning. Right. I, I don't know if that's a good example. I just threw that out there. I wanted to add something onto that. Just the reason these programs like- Can you speak up, Sam? Yes. So the reason these programs like Master Hunter and our program, Warrior Hunter, are growing is the ranches are asking for it. They want to manage their wildlife. They want to give access to vets. They're caught in a, in, a, in a bind where developers are coming to them trying to buy them off. Some of our premier ranchers face that pressure weekly. Weekly. And they also are dealing with government that's trying to get their hands in the honey pot. And then they're dealing with trespassers, poachers, and tremendous out-of-state pressure for out-of-state programs. To allow allow them on their ranch. The one premier ranch we have hadn't let anybody hunt elk in 50 years on the ranch. Wow. And they had wounded warriors. They had have they had 30 different outside groups coming in knocking on their door. And they said to us, we want to be able to knock on your door in Missoula if there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wanted local. And so these land issues Second point on it, we went to the fishing game. I think you were there, Danny, but I know Ed was there and Steve was there and myself where they had 10,000 over-the-counter tags last year for Region 2. 
if you remember, if you wanted to get it, if you oh, yeah. yeah. okay, I was at yeah. that meeting. Yeah, what was that, Ed? Oh, yeah, I was just trying to remember. I was at that meeting at the uh, whatever hotel it was at. Branches okay. came to Fish and Game and said we were overwhelmed, we couldn't keep up with the phone call for access. This has got to go. And what did Fish and Game do? They asked, they responded, it's gone. So these pressures are tremendous out there with out-of-staters, California cash buyers. I know that applies to other states. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but I, I concept, not trying to pick on California, but, you know, it's creating a very high-pressure dynamic out there for organizations like yours and programs like ours. There could be some benefit um, to why our programs are growing. Master Hunters' applications are off the chart right now. Ours is growing rapidly. That's why. That's why ranches are going to move towards programs they can trust and hunters that have been ethically vetted, that are ethical, conservation minded, and can, can shoot and plan that, right? So I just want to add that why the, the pressure points are moving towards these kind of programs. A guy like Dylan or a guy like Sam Redfern going and knocking on these ranches, forget about it. They get access. It's not going to happen anymore. The good old days, my dad, you know, used to knock. Say, hey, we'll come fix your fence. Mostly guys. Well, I'm one of those California but not cash guys. <laughs> but amongst other reasons, I was looking forward to coming here so I can get back into a regular hunting. It's hard in California. You have to go far or whatever. So I was looking forward to just like I used to be in a kid back in the East in New York, just go hunt, go knock on a door. And I was very disappointed when I got here. And I started knocking on doors and I was turned down for one reason or another. And um, that's got to be dealt with, right. educated, whatnot. And you see, you understand why that is. Now. Well, you got to keep the Californians out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but educate the people and educate the hunters to get rid of the riprap. And it kind of, it, it, again, not only I think through these, it's, it's harder and harder to be a rancher, you know, and, and they now are receiving these new options to them um, to be just a standard rancher without all these other options as taxes for their properties go up and up and up and up, you know, and it just continues. And so they're trying to find these alternative means and sources of income. And that's a great one. And, and so what you're seeing is a lot of these well-established family owned for generation ranches get parceled out when when grandpa passes and it's unfortunate and then suddenly there isn't hunting around that area there isn't there isn't habitat for those animals to thrive um not not even if you do or don't hunt they don't have that access you, you know when we talk about our access talk about the deer's access they don't have, well i guess they have access in missoula but you know <laughs> <laughs> they don't have access uh, they wouldn't have access if that's getting subdivided in one of those communities um and you know we were out hunting last year and and there was a herd of elk on the gen uh, anyway so we, we were out hunting is <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> of nowhere creek of nowhere creek so so we we need we needed we need access coordinates yeah <laughs> we needed access to get through a piece of private property to get to public land is where we were at and uh and these folks it was an old school teacher of mine and and she almost broke down in tears crying and said, we don't let anybody hunt or, or walk through our property or hunt the property anymore. Because last year, somebody we let hunt, they were down here in the field as they normally should be. They saw the elk on, on the hill behind my house. They shot over our house. Oh, okay. you, you think that that's dumb, but that's kind of those notions of ethical hunting. You just got to know, you know, that you should know if that's right or wrong. Um, it, there was nothing obscuring, you know, but the point is, is they, they face year after year after year of people knocking on their door um, and, and maybe they say yes, maybe they say no, but people oftentimes abuse those privileges or assume that the rancher has a lot of property and, and he says, no, you can't hunt on my property. And then as he's driving around, he notices on the east, east side, there's the truck and there's only one place to go back onto his property. He just didn't take the normal gate. That's not going to sit well with anybody, anybody that has property. Um, and it certainly is going to take away opportunity for people down the road. And it is, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, especially when, you know, there are certain states where sometimes it's cheaper 
to just go and poach than it is to get an out-of-state tag. That's not right, but some people choose that. That's, again, those choices we make. Um, you know, as, as, as we're here on a call with a lot of veterans, you know, you guys made the ultimate choice and the sacrifice. And, and you know, it's, it's great that there, there's an organization that, that you're all a part of that's actually promoting the ethics side of it because that's the backbone of, of those, those pieces that will, will create a system that will stay and always stay. You can't, if you're always going to be ethical and do the right thing, you know, if somebody's going to argue with that, they're wrong. They're just wrong. Um, and that'll hold true for years and years and generations to come. And then you'll get back on the Jensen's property. I see Sam, <laughs> Sam Rosling, you got your hand up there. Oh uh, yeah. Probably going to backtrack a little bit, but I wanted to uh, go back on the comment about um, hunting becoming uh, unaffordable and stuff like that for people. I just wanted to bring up a point about a, um, we used to have a lot of mule deer up here in Libby, Montana, and the population kind of went downhill, obviously because of logging and, and whatever, certain things like that, the mule deer population itself is declining. So anyways, about five years ago, we had a group of uh, hunters who decided to make a well hunted area permit only. And uh, they went through all the process and, and it went through and right or wrong or indifferent, I, I'm not really here to talk about that, but it ended up uh, stopping a lot of mule deer hunting in a area that people went up to at easy access, a lot of roads, and uh, a lot of the road hunters now can't go up there and hunt. So it kind of divided a lot of the hunters up here in, in Northwest Montana, Libby, Montana, just because the meat hunters now were competing against the, uh, for lack of better terms, the trophy hunters, because they wanted to build a trophy area, so to speak. And, and they did want to help uh, the mule deer population by getting more mature bucks to live a lot longer. So like I said, I just wanted to touch base on that and see where you guys thought about certain groups like that that come through. And like I said, they went through the proper channels and I mean, it was a public comment period and everything. It was a long drawn out process. They did their work they had a lot of good research and a lot of good facts on uh, the mule deer harvest, the, the mature rate, the age that these deer were getting um, harvested and stuff like that. So can you touch on that, on, on groups like that, trying to uh, not necessarily close down areas, but make areas permit areas and, and the whole permit area process. And just to add to that, Sam, uh, down here in the Bitterroot, there's a, a region that when they went permit only a number of years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago, 270. And it was one of the most sought after mule deer tags uh, in the state because they had record book uh, mule deer genetics down there. And, you know, they're giving out 40, 60 permits a year was all, but the um, poaching skyrocketed. And, and there really aren't any more, you know, Boone and Crockett bucks being harvested because poachers are tagging them all. And, and so it's a, it has turned into a different kind of problem. Uh, Cause like your area, this was pretty easy access, a lot of roads, open country due to logging, which really helped the mule deer thrive out there. But it was, um, um, you know, there's, there's a couple sides to that coin. You know, they, they wanted to, grow the, the trophy bucks, um, increase the age um, of, the, of the bucks in the herd, but they ended up um, yeah. fighting other problems. Yeah, no, and yeah. that's a really great point. To, and I'm gonna give you, from my, my perspective, kind of a bureaucratic answer, to, to be honest, because you know there are studies out there that say that not only can, can the population of a herd, um, if it's too low, it could decline and, and drop off, you know, drastically or, or all the way. There's also studies that say that if the population's too thick, too dense, that, you know, like a, there was a mule deer situation, I think in the Dakotas, or Wyoming maybe, I don't remember exactly where, where they, you know, they got public opinion to say, no, they can't be hunted here. There became way too many disease spread and they, wipe, they wiped themselves out because people didn't want them hunted. 
Now, if I if I understand the Libby thing right, um, Sam, it sounds like, um, you know, there are a lot of studies that say that if you can wait for an animal to become more mature, um, or, or you know that that you can't shoot an animal unless it has a certain size rack or a certain age, um, that it will it will help the population as a whole and it will create bigger. There are conversely other studies. Unfortunately, there is no. I could not tell you what is right or wrong. Um, depends on what article I would have read that day. Um, that say that no, you want to be able to kill off some of those younger ones. You know, it allows the bigger bulls to thrive and and to produce offspring and and to um, create a better genetic um, uh, uh, um, uh, base. Yeah. Uh, better genetic base. So both of them, I, I really don't know. Um, I'd probably have to know a little bit more about the Libby study too. It, I, I would just err on that somebody made the decision that they felt was right. And it was one of those that it burned half and it pleased half. And I, I don't know. Um, and, and was that, that was Sam that asked that question, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, just to expand on that a little bit. So just recently, within the last two years, we ended up getting uh, CWD up here. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fish and Game decided to hand out unlimited either sex whitetail tags to try to decrease that population. So I guess my concern now is that uh, now everybody essentially has two buck tags. Now I'm afraid in these other areas that we don't have in that mule deer permit area, everybody's going to go out and shoot their mule deer buck for the meat with their A tag and this B tag, they're gonna go out and shoot uh, a whitetail buck. So I think we've, we've entered into a perfect storm of losing a lot of good quality deer population up here in Libby just because of that. And obviously the, that group of hunters didn't expect this to happen and, and they may not think that, but I, I kind of do. I kind of think we, we, we have the perfect storm here brewing. Kind of like I meant with the, the wolf reintroduction and essentially that started with uh, uh, the stopping of logging really in the late 90s so to me that was a perfect storm bad timing all around not really wanting to get into the wolf population thing but I'm, I'm just saying is you know the CWD now happened with that permit area kind of happening at the same time and uh, you know the ethics of hey you may, make sure you stay inside that CWD area to, to harvest your buck might not happen. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I wish I could expand more on it. You know, that might be something that if you called the club, maybe we could get you one of our biologists that know a little bit more about that than me. Um, yeah. It sounds like you were in the perfect storm. Sorry. I couldn't expand more on that, Sam. No, that's okay. I appreciate it though. I'd, I'd like to add something. I'm from Pennsylvania originally. And back when I grew up, if you got a poor corn, you were doing good. You, you were worried about whether you're going to get spiked or, I mean, the average deer was a poor corn or a spike. And about 10 or 15 years ago, they made it a point size. And well, well, let me add one thing. I got a, a four by three in 68, the year I got out of the army. And, and we were all amazed. We thought this is a huge buck. And it, was a, it wasn't. It, would have, it was a year and a half old. So just think what that buck could have been if it would have been a two and a half or three and a half. But the, the, uh, a few years back, maybe 10, I don't know the exact number, Pennsylvania did go to some point regulation. And hunters are extremely happy. Yeah, point regulations. Thank you. I couldn't remember what that was called. Yeah, and you know, it, it's that's why a lot of fish and game are managed on a state by state basis because you couldn't assume that what how they do it in Pennsylvania is exactly the same as Texas is exactly the same as Montana. So you know, they try to do their best locally, and it is unfortunate. It sounds like those people kind of came in and and maybe they they are making some decisions that, that might have been sounded right but they didn't know all of the logistics to uh, what is what is Boone and Crockett's position on CWD and what's going on there is there any, are you guys involved in that or oh yeah uh, so CWD chronic wasting disease it's a it's a 
it's a disease that attacks the prions in a deer, um, uh, uh, the pr a protein. It's much like mad cow disease, um, uh, where except right now there's no studies that say it can transfer to a human like mad cow disease, but that's basically deteriorates their brain. Um, and and if you ever see a deer wandering around that looks just drunk or than drunker than drunk, he probably has chronic wasting disease, and you should probably call fish and game. Um, the club, though, they, they recognized that this was a problem uh, pretty early on, and we helped found the CWD Alliance um, with a number of other conservation organizations. Okay. Yep, yep, we were one of, the, one of the founding organizations. Yeah, helped found it, yeah. And no, uh, we found it. Oh, ultimately. Yep. Um, Earl Morgan Rock, who owned Morgan Rock Music, got the staff in and said, let's do something. Let's create this CWD Alliance. So, the club started. I didn't know that. Morgan Roth music, huh? Here in town? Earl Morgan Roth, yeah. Oh, crazy. Well, that's good history. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, so so now, I mean, we don't really have a position on it um, because it is a disease that needs more research. We have funded it the last few years. Um, but the problem is, is that you can't, you can't test a live deer. That deer has to be dead. And it's only cervid, so deer, elk, you know. Um, uh, and, and so it has to be dead to test. So there's no way, and this, this prion stays alive um, for much longer than this animal is dead. Um, and so it can transfer and it transfers saliva, urine, you know, body fluids, things like that. And, um, and, and so, so deer sniffing blood, gut piles, and blood mm -hmm. trails and pick it up. Yep, exactly. And you wouldn't know it unless you got it tested usually. And um, if you're in a CWD area, CWD area. You want your deer tested. Yes, if you're in a CWD area, you want it tested. Or elk. Any survey, yep. Deer, elk. They say you may want to question moose, but I don't think that there's been a case in moose. But they also want to get ahead of it if that does. Um, and the education piece is not there for a lot of folks. Um, last year, two years ago, last year or two years ago, we were hunting up near Great Falls, and uh, and. A, a gentleman said, yeah, go up this creek, whatever, you know, we saw some game. Uh, my grandson just harvested something, and, and, and we said, well, did you get it checked at the check station? This was the first zone in Montana that had received a CWD um, case, and so we were nervous, too, because it happened like a week before we got there, um, and we asked, did you get it checked? And he goes, no, no, I cut it open. The meat was red. It was fine. <laughs> that's not at all. I mean, if you if you don't understand the joke, that's not at all how how you know. You wouldn't know. You would not. You have to have a lab and studies to know. Um, yeah. What's up, Jack? If you shoot a deer in the head that has CWD, it will be throughout its body before it gets it down. The CWD will. CWD oh, will. yeah. The, whatever. Yeah. The prions. Yeah, the prions. Yeah. I think I. Learned. We we had we had two moose test positive for CWD last year up here. Oh, really? Yes. I've been behind on, on watching it. You know, though we're supposed to be involved, it's been kind of a year where involvement in that hasn't been as strong, really, realistically. Um, we but, got an antelope last year that was uh, that had CWD, and we cut it open. Its whole insides were all rotted out and looked like it had cancer, and it was just nasty looking. That would be something different. Yeah, That's that might, unusual. well, it, likely not. And, you know, CWD does degenerate yeah. the brain, which might cause it to eat something it wouldn't, or, or, you know, there could be other variables. Likely, though, if the disease was rotting away the insides, though, it wouldn't probably be CWD. Um, it, it's a brain disease, like uh, in cephalite, in deal, I can't say the word. Yeah. Cephalopathy. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> mad, cow, cephalopathy. yeah mad cow disease. Yeah, it, it's a brain disease. Um, likely what you had might be something different. You might want to get that checked. Get check <laughs> oh, yeah, we got rid of it. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody can verify this. I, I, I hunt up Chinook Haver area for muleys. And uh, in the 690 area, just below Highway 2. And this year, the CWD has finally gotten into a small part of the area. But I was told it's so pervasive now that you don't have to dress it in the field. You could you could bring it home as long as you check it in at the check station. That I could bring it back here and, and take it to the meat locker. So as long as the remains go into the landfill and not laid out, 
I couldn't believe that, but he said it's getting so pre prevalent that it's okay now. I don't know if anybody else has heard that. No, that's not what Muster Hunter says. No. You want to get that tested. Uh, no, get it tested. Yeah, but it used to be you had to take, you had to dress the meat yeah. in the field yeah. and only take the meat out. Right. But he told me, he says, no, you can take the whole carcass out. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of state different state laws as to how they want it handled. Well, it didn't too. used to be that yeah. way last year. You yeah, they couldn't move it. Yeah, you couldn't move it last year. That's good to I know this year. I'd have to. Move it, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but there there is it's actually causing a lot of uproar in the um, the captive deer industry. You know those the high fence and others that do studies or you know pay to shoot um, because they transfer deer across state lines and right. and so there was a lot of conservation groups that said you know. Hey, we're really sorry. I know this might affect you, but we cannot be transferring this disease over state lines, and you cannot interstate travel. Um, in in uh, you can't do it commercially interstate travel. You need to check with if you're going to hunt in a specific state what that those laws are. Not only that state, but the transfer to any state you might be driving through. Um, and and honestly, if you ask me what those laws are in these states right it's, now, I don't know. It's like dropping a bunch of pike in a cutthroat. What's the cutthroat? Yeah. Yeah, it'll and spread. Montanans want to preserve the pristine things that happen. And so, you know, look at our muscle, you know, boats, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody <laughs> in the muscle. state, your boat will be inspected. Yeah. And, you know, but that, I don't see that trend changing at all in Montana. Okay. And people want to protect what they have. But it's it's moving. CWDs in 300s now, it's up to interstate. In the yeah. You know, but that's one of the arguments against high fencing originally in this state too, was the disease yeah. aspect. And the, the, remember that, Jack? The game farm. There are two people involved in getting rid of game farm. You one of them? My wife was the one, yeah. <laughs> and the other guys passed away. I remember that battle in the legislature. And it was Montana saying, "We don't want this stuff here. We don't right. want the disease." Okay. We got about what ten minutes? No, if that, two. Two. Um, what I'd like to do is to be able to give Danny a couple minutes to talk about benefits of being in Boone and Crockett membership. We do have some handouts here, um, Dylan. If you'd open up the box real quick, maybe give everyone a pure handout. Oh, uh, there's there's two ma two two, two okay. different magazines in each box. One's a yearbook, and one's uh, um, the actual Fair Chase magazine. But content yeah, the yearbooks and, field photos. and then real quick uh steve if you could pitch this weekend in the next okay so you say something Danny, about membership uh, for your yeah. program I'll, I'll make it quick you know we always encourage membership we appreciate it what you get is a fair chase magazine which um has from science articles to ethics articles and of course the field photos that make it into the record book um it's 35 dollars a year and uh and and if you can't join or you don't want to or, or whatever um, we still encourage you no matter what the size of your animal is that you harvest still enter it into the book um, it's only going to get better for us to have more animals in, in the book more of a data set and, and we encourage you to enter it even if it's small still still enter it you know that's exciting for us and hopefully we can expand one day to not only have trophy quality animals in there but um, but every kind and, and I uh, am putting my money where my mouth is and doing a membership check tonight for Dan. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. Okay, so just before we adjourn here real quick, Saturday uh, we have another range day. It's our last uh, scheduled range day. We need everybody that's going to be involved in this program that wants to graduate needs to make it to at least one range day. So if you, if you made it last week, um, you don't have to come this week, but uh, if you plan on hunting and being part of this program and graduating, you need to make the range day. So um, it's going to be down at the MPG ranch again at the main gate this time. We're not going <laughs> to try to weasel everybody up through the hills and every, in the woods like we did last week um, and, and avoid a nasty neighbor. But um, <laughs> anyway, I'll send out an email tomorrow morning with those details, with the directions reminding everyone but if you talk to somebody let them know um, if they're in this program let them know that we've got the range day and uh, we need you all there so and if I, show. yeah and if, if, if anybody needs ammo or you need a, a rifle or you need gear 
uh, we will find something for you. So please let us know. And secondly, we might, might, might have an off uh, uh, rifle day for stragglers that couldn't make it. Uh, I don't want to call them stragglers, but just yeah. massive schedule conflict. conflict. Please, if you can, make it this Saturday. Yep. But we, we might have one last option because uh, we've got, I think, 50 hunters in the program this year. Yep. And we want them all to graduate. We want them all to graduate. So we'll, we'll work with you to, to try to help. But um, ammo's getting tight. I don't know if anybody's been out there shopping. Uh, well, Axman has a low. Sure Axman's low? Has a low. Has a quite a bit. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Days ago. Cabela, Cabela's, Bob Ward's, the, 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 the pickings are getting thin. At, at the okay. these sporting the more common sporting goods stores. So, uh, yeah, we should send him out and buy them. But <laughs> anyway, um, bring plenty of ammo Saturday. If you're coming, we're gonna make sure your rifle is sighted in, and then we're gonna try to get everybody. We got a point where you can shoot at some farther gongs, uh, longer range gongs to test the effective range for your fire for you for you and your firearm. So come prepared to shoot a bunch. And then uh, land navigation, that, that's going to take a couple hours too. So we'll rotate folks through. It's a good time. And uh, we just, like I said, we want everybody to graduate. So make it if you can. And next week we have Jeff Dara, retired from the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. We'll be training on Wednesday night. Tuesday the 6th. Tuesday the 6th. Tuesday the 6th. From what time to what time? 6.30 to 8.30 again, next Tuesday. And please check the Facebook group. I posted the History of American Conservation. 65 pages from Bruno and Crockett. And That's the one you posted? Yeah, yeah, the 2012. It's <laughs> a good one. And then one page fair chase. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Yes. We'll talk to you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate all the conversation. It was a good, good uh, session tonight. We're going to go ahead all. and log out of here. So, good, good night, night. Tyler, Sam, Garrett. Thank you. Good night, Garrett, Heather. All right.